G'day, it's Osher Ginsberg. This is Better Than Yesterday, making it better every episode since 2013. My name's Osher Ginsberg. I am a podcaster, I'm an author, I'm a TV host, I'm a dad, I'm a stepdad, I'm a French death metal explorer, I am a camera card data wrangler. Sometimes I do a terrible job at that. I'm a man who plays Patsy Cline to his son before bedtime rather than sing him lullabies. Walk in at midnight. It's, it's a good vibe. Taryn Brumfit. Is here. She's the 2023 Australian of the Year. She's leader of the Body Image Movement, which is an organization based in Adelaide that teaches people to love and appreciate their bodies. She's made two brilliant films, Embrace and Embrace Kids. The first film explores the serious issue of women's body loathing, the loathing of their own body, and Taryn's path to body acceptance. The second film, Embrace Kids, has a message for 9 to 14-year-olds to move, to nourish and respect and appreciate what their bodies can do. She's a four-time best-selling author, including the book, the new book, Chico the Schnauzer, uh, which I uh, read to Wolfie sometimes at bedtime. He's four and a half. And what's the book about? Well, it's basically Chico goes on a big play date and she spends a bunch of time with different dogs, including um, Susie the Sausage Dog. There's a, a poodle called Penelope. There's a Dalmatian called Digby, which is wild because I know a person called Digby. Does not look like a poodle. Uh, there's a few other books. Don't want to spoil it. But in the book, Chico learns about all the things that the different dogs' bodies are good at. Now, he can't perhaps do all the things that they can, like my dog Frank can't really jump on the bed like uh, other dogs can. It is funny. He normally gets it about the third time. We try not to laugh at him. Uh, but Chico does discover all the incredible things that his own body is good at. Chico is actually quite similar to my dog, Frank, because my dog, Frank, can do some things but can't do others. Our mate brought his bulldog, Tucker, around the other day, and Tucker can stare at a tennis ball wedged under a sofa for 10 straight minutes and not move. It was amazing. Frank will see that same ball because he was running around and go, meh, and go and nap. Nah, he just wasn't interested. Different dogs have different things. Different bodies can do different things. That's what the book is about. So enough. Wolf and I even talk about it uh, when, when we read it. That's what we talk about, how you know Frankie and, and Lilo, our two dogs, are very different. So, yes, this is, the, this is why kids' books are kids' books. You talk to your kids afterwards. Back to Taryn. Uh, Taryn is a two-time marathon runner. She's got four kids of her own. She's absolutely marvelous. We do cover a lot in this conversation. We cover self-talk, body image, self-acceptance, and the problem with comparison. We also pick apart the very tricky business of dating in middle age and come into the realization that, oh, someone new who hasn't been on this journey of child rearing with me is going to see me naked. I had not reared children uh, when I was dating again in my 40s, but yes, I definitely struggled with the, oh, someone new is going to see me naked moment myself. It was, it's a good bit. Uh, it's a fantastic conversation. I'm so glad you made time to come on the show. I hope you enjoy it. Lovely to see you. I'm so sorry I am I am late. It is um, because there was an unplanned explosion of bin juice on my kitchen floor. It happens. It, it Living happens. room rug. <laughs> it and happens. I've been on my hands and knees with hand sanitizer using alcohol, scrubbing into a rug. <laughs> while dogs and toddlers try to get <sighs> you know then mama's just holding on you know <laughs> <laughs> maggie dent to aisle five <laughs> maggie dent to aisle five uh yeah wow people who've got kids um younger uh than our eldest right so i've known her for 11 years and coming into our 11th year now so i've kind of ahead of the curve for a for a few people mm. and as they see their two and four and well five and eight year olds boy and girl just behave so completely differently mm. and observe how the world observes them so completely differently what is it about parenting uh, children once you're aware of how the world looks at boys and girls mm. what is about that that uh, you see has changed since you started doing this work yeah, I think for such a long time in specific to body image that it seemed like it was just a problem for women and it was about weight 
and then it became an issue for young girls and now everyone's part of the conversation, unfortunately. It's one of those occasions where you don't want everyone part of the conversation. Um, but I guess it's just the way that it's been a trend um, and especially probably for, for marketers who are driving some of the beauty standards um, that then we try and live up to and then we fall short and then we feel bad and then we buy the product. So I think what I've noticed in doing this work for a decade now is that more and more young people, whether they're boys or girls or, or however they identify, just have issues with how they feel about their bodies. And the good thing for us is that the principles to help them change um, and feel better about their bodies are universal. So, and they just make a lot of sense and they're really practical and they're really easy to apply. And, and pretty much if you were to just just distill it down. It's focusing on what your body can do and how you feel um, and getting the balance right. Um, sure, you might care how you look or you might want to do your hair or wear this or do that. That's fun. Have Go for it. But don't ever allow the how you look dominate over how you feel in your body. As I say often on this show, the the, be- the worst thing about parenting is that they don't do what you tell them, but they do do what you show them. And that's the worst thing. That's the worst thing. <laughs> I'm sure. I know my kids that, swear like troopers. I'm like, whoops, we well, can't get it all yeah. right. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. So since since doing this work, and you know, obviously there's a there's a set of you know, I guess for want of a better word, practices, protocols, whatever things that you do to make sure that you keep a handle on things. Of those things, what's the one that you you yourself struggle with keeping up and making sure that you try to set an example of? It's a great question. Um, I mean, in the space of body image, I, would, mm. I, I think I would get pretty much a 10 out of 10 for that one because this is the work I live and breathe. And that's what I mean. Yeah. The things outside of body image, not so much. Um, yeah, right. But I think for me, and oh, I must be really careful in saying that that's, that's me and I live this world. Um, it's like a bodybuilder bodybuilding and being really strong and having muscles. That's their job, right? So um, yeah. I, I don't want anyone to hear that and think, oh, I've got to be perfect because that's the yeah, last yeah. thing I would want anyone to think. Um, but really for me, you, you, I think for people, you only know what you know when you know it. And so people often when creating change for themselves or within their family I think there's a lot of overwhelm that that gets in the way and I think what we try and teach and what I try and talk about is just being really practical just doing your best you make mistakes that's okay um, and just keep trying Uh, and I think when it comes to body image the good thing that we've got going for us is that all of the principles and all the things we want people to do are actually really fun. Like move your body, nourish your body, respect your body, enjoy your body. Like that shouldn't be too hard. (laughs) The line, and you mentioned bodybuilders, I lift weights. Uh, I used to run, can't run anymore, Um, but I lift weights. And so there's a few people that I follow that I'm like, oh, that looks kind of interesting. I'm, you know, the guys around my age. Next thing I know, I'm just seeing dudes who are older than me with their shirts off, just fucking ripped. I'm like, oh my God. (laughs) As I start unfollowing and just like comparison is the center point of misery. Yeah. It's just, how do you handle that? Yeah. I mean, it's so funny that you just said that word because the whole time you were saying that was just like, oh, comparison item. That old chestnut, how it makes us feel so shit when, when we. But sometimes it's good though. Sometimes it makes us go. You know what? I want to. I want that house. Sure. Yeah, I want that job. Sure. I want that partner. I want that family. kind of relationship. I want the kid who behaves like that. You know, it's okay in doses, surely. Of course it is, and that's you know it's balance, right? But there's I, I will share with you a quote that I share with every audience I ever speak to, and it's by a man called Steve Furtick, and he says, "Don't compare your behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel," and we just we just constantly um, do that. When you're talking about bodies, I remember for me um, that was one of the most significant changes that I made was to stop looking at bodies. Like we know that as little as seven minutes on Instagram looking at bodies makes us feel anxious, um, can lead us to depression. Like it just makes us feel shit to look at someone else's body and go, I want that. So I think in terms of social media, the easiest thing that we can do is just not look at bodies, just remove them from our feed, look at landscapes. Um, My feed 
um, is full of cat videos. And I was a dog person my whole life until I met my husband of only one year and a couple of months. And, um, he's a cat person. And now it's like the, they're hilarious. Um, so my 10 minutes on, actually, no, it's a bit more than that. It's probably my half an hour on social is looking at people I love and look up to, you know, whether it, the Taria Pitts of the world or the Grace Chains or pe- people whose voices I really admire. I have a little moment for that and I have a little moment for joy and laughter and then I'm out. And I feel pretty good about that. And I think that's the choice we can all make when it comes to social media. Is It is a choice we can make. It's a hard one to make though. I'm of the era where I still text people whom I know with my phone yet interpersonal communications are all through apps mm. yeah i guess it's a i guess the tipping point will come like how shit do we need to feel before we actually make the change <laughs> tell me about that tell me about the you know the what is it the 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 will to change shows up when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the fear of of changing yeah i mean i think it's i think it's a little bit of that but I also think it's a little bit of empowerment. I, I in particular know, and, I, and, you know, again, in my family, my kids, are, the way that they communicate is completely different. And it's such a big brain adjustment to even be able to understand or even relate to it. Like, to me, it's so absurd. Um, but I, I think that all we can do is chip away at this and get people to get really intuitive with how they feel after the exchange or just being on their phone for hours, you know, in their rooms. Like, how, how, how do you feel? I feel a bit, you know, I feel okay um, or I feel a bit crap or whatever it is. I think mm. it's about them getting intuitive, but I also think it's about just sprinkling and peppering um, that education piece, which I think we did a really good job of that in the Embrace Kids film. Um, we had electric field pop up. Um, in the film to say like, don't look at it on your screens, go and do it in life. And I know that a lot of kids have resonated with that passion that they shared and the way that they shared it, but I don't have the solution for, oh, no. and I know you're not asking for it, but it's just, no. I, it's something I think about all the time because recently I've been doing this now for about four months. I've been packing a book with me everywhere I go and every time I feel like opening up my phone because I'm so, I was so addicted like we all are and, and just, like it just naturally happens. Instead, I go, oh, I'm going to open up my book. And so at the doctor's surgery um, or on public transport or, or wherever I am, and it's only when I've started to do that over the last four months that I've realized how much time I've been on my phone and the toilet who knew there's some lonely lonely shampoo bottles out there <laughs> Tyron. like I, there's a whole generation of kids that don't know how to pronounce sodium laureth sulfate <laughs> i do because i've got um, that board on the toilet i would read the back of a shampoo bottle i'm with you we knew so little we knew so much about all the things we don't need to but yeah it's pretty it's pretty wild isn't yeah, it yeah it, it does speak to that part of our body you know that is, you know, our brain, the part of our body that, you know, where our dopamine system gets dysregulated. Mm. And I certainly know that around food. It might not be food, but it is, you know, it's the same thing. It's looking for a way to not experience this moment. I need to get out of this moment rather than being in this moment. For some people, it's food. For some people, it's your phone. For some people, it's gambling, porn, bad relationships, whatever. Mm. You know, how early on do you think it's, uh, is it useful to start talking to kids about, yeah, it's uncomfortable this moment here, Mm. but we can be with it versus, oh, quick, let's get this better, whatever that is. Yeah, it's true. And I will let your listeners know that I'm not a child psychologist. Nor am I. (laughs) But, But when you were just saying that, I was just thinking about a therapy session I had a couple of weeks ago where just what exactly what you were saying, the discomfort of just being with your own thoughts. And I was actually yeah. talking to Tim Jarvis the other day, um, South Australian of the Year, you know, it spends, you know, weeks on end on his own in Antarctica. And I'm like, oh my God, that's terrifying. Like all that time to think. And even just coming to that realisation um, that we just, we just distract ourselves so much. It's like, wow, what's there? What's in the basement that you didn't know was there? I'm not, sh- I'm not so sure. I'm liking that, but good to know. How much are we underestimating our capacity to cope with our own 
uncomfortable thoughts and feelings. Yeah. How much are we robbing ourselves of the necessary skill of dealing with them? Every time we avoid it, we get a little less good at it. Yeah. You know, we might have, you know, learned how to juggle when we were 18 and first year uni or whatever. Mm. And then now we need to do it again. Yeah. We can't do it. It's like if we don't use it. Yes. It can spin out. I don't definitely know about that. Mm. The idea of talking to kids about body image is, um, you know, I don't talk about this much, but um, I, I was, it was not, I'm old, right, Taryn? Hey, 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 stop right there. How, no, 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 I am. Well, tell me how old you are. I, well, in 1982, I was eight. Oh, God, I can't even do that right now. I told you, I'm old. Like, I'm nearly 50. I'll be 50. Uh, well, I'm, 40, I'm 46. So, we're, we're, so, but in 1982, I'm eight and I'm sitting in a Weight Watchers. Mm. with uh, my mum because I was 48, 50 kilos mm. at a hundred and not that many centimetres, mm. mm-hmm. you know. And, um, you know, I'm number two of four brothers, but I'm the one that just couldn't stop putting food in my mouth rather than be with the weird feelings in my body. Mm. And I remember sitting, like sitting in this room, you know, there was a, I don't know if you've ever been, but there's like a way in and uh-huh. years later when I started going to sobriety meetings, I was like, oh, all right, that's, oh, Weight Watchers is just, you know, this, but for fatty. Oh, okay. It's the same meeting. It's the same thing. It's the same, <laughs> same steps. It's everything. It's the same, but that one you pay for. <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I always used to call myself. I don't know if I should say this, but I'm going, oh, I'm no longer Australian of the Year. I can say whatever I want now. Um, I always have to check check before I say things. But WW, I always used to call myself the Weight Watchers whore, WWW, because I would always be back for more. This was just a running joke oh. in my own head when I would fall off the wagon, put weight oh, back yeah. on, and then go again, and then, you know, the, the cycle. Um, yeah. Yeah, pretty, pretty depressing and really um, deeply sad for a child to be put on the scales and – Oh yeah, but it was it was. To be honest, I'm only process like so. I'm literally just talking to you about this now, and I'm thinking about it. It actually felt better than how much shame I felt. Um, I actually knew as a kid, even like being in action is something that makes it feel better. Mm. Whatever it is, mm-hmm. as long as you're taking a direction, a move in a direction away from the thing that's not fun, you're going to be okay. And so, going to those things and doing the right thing, like eating the way I was, everything. Like I lost a lot of weight put more back on but it actually felt okay it was better than as i said the shame and the you know early 80s in boys are boys yeah you've got a couple yeah when they're eight nine years old and you know there's me at swimming in bloody dick togs in queensland yeah no fun yeah it was no fun at all yeah i bet how do you start to even talk to a kid if you're listening to this now and you're looking at your son i mean like there was a point where um I think mum just saw that I was just ashamed to wear any clothes mm. that didn't weren't two sizes too big. Mm. If you're talking to a kid and you can see your your son or daughter is is you know ashamed in their own body, and I was you know I was too big, and there was all kinds of problems that came along with it as I got bigger, mm. like both both ways, like like really awfully gnarly infected chafing. Now people who have been big will know what I'm talking about: under the arms, back of the knees, between the thighs. No fun in Queensland in the summer. Let me tell you, there's a special cream you get to go get for that one. And um, <laughs> how do you talk to it? How do you even deal with the thing you might be feeling in yourself? Because as a parent, it's your fridge. Yeah. Then you might be the one taking it through the drive through. Like, how do you deal with that as a parent? Yeah. I mean, this is the entire catalyst for the film Embrace Kids that we made because it's a really tough conversation to have with your kids. You want and and you always want to say the right thing and do the right thing by your kids, but you also don't know all the answers. And and we thought if we could, knowing all of the trauma um, and the big issues that kids are facing and don't know how to face, and even parents don't know how to face, if we could kind of unpack some of it in a film and sort of talk about a range of these challenges, that it could open up a conversation and because there's so many nuances to a family unit and how things are, how things are spoken about. Um, and we, we did that and I think that's where it always has to begin, um, just open, honest, sometimes tough, sometimes uncomfortable uh, conversations. And then when you don't 
have all the answers. I think calling in other people to, you know, have that support is really critical as well. I don't want to sound like, you know, plugging a film here. I mean, God, you can see the film free on, you know, Foxtel and Binge and a range of places that I probably should know. Yeah. But um, for um, eight-year-olds plus, we just have seen some really um, powerful shifts in their thinking and even uh, watching. So we have data. So we've had our first round of evaluations that the Three Flinders University that shows um, a, an increase and a significant increase in self-compassion um, after watching the film, which is a really um, tough one. So the academics tell me to, to sort of strive for and, and, and achieve. So, and I think that's kind of cool because, you know, um, hurt people hurt people and um, you know, self-compassion for th- thyself can be um, really good for other people and that whole bullying, um, you know, problem that we have as well. So there's that. Um, but also having spent um, so much time watching teenagers watch the film, I just anecdotally have seen some of those kind of hard and tough teenage boys see someone on this big screen getting bullied and the the fallout, you know, of that and and watch tears in eyes and cogs turning and it's, the, you know, it's a beautiful thing. So Embrace Kids I think is a great place to start to open a conversation. Because a lot of the times we just do what we know and what we know might be the thing that our parents did or the people that raised us and we're just going off the information we've got but we might not yeah. realise that it might not be the best <laughs> Idea. Totally. I mean, the, the fat conversation is actually probably a really good example of that, of, of when a child says to their parent, like, am I fat? And the parent's like, no, you're not fat. Of course you're not fat. And that's how they want to sort of fix that really uncomfortable conversation. But of course, that actually does more harm um, because we demonize fat then. Uh, so there's that mm. sort of camp. Then there's other people saying, but what about health and, you know, fitness and well-being? And it's like, there's actually, we're all on the same page here. Because what we know is that people who embrace their bodies and in particular young people who embrace their bodies and have a higher appreciation of their body image are more likely to eat fruit and vegetables and they're more likely to move their bodies. They're less likely to smoke and drink and vape and take illicit drugs. So kind of this fighting that we often see need not be even a thing because we're all on the same page. Um, just I think some people have just got to let the research and the data coming out of the academics who've been doing this for a number of years, let them lead the way instead of just their own biases. <laughs> I don't know how to navigate this part because in recent years or so, this idea that um, I'm healthy just the way I am is, well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I know what the precursor of type 2 diabetes looks like. And I don't think you're going to like living life with that. <laughs> um, uh, and, and that's, you know, almost it's difficult to have that conversation. I don't, I don't even know where to, how to approach it. Like where does the line, where is the line there of you are perfect as you are and there are health issues that start to crop up once your body gets to a certain point. And they're, they're not only going to affect you, but your family and people around you and your work and all kinds of stuff. Like, where do you, where do you approach that? Yeah, there's there's actually no line to even draw. It's actually again, we're just we're all on the same page here because what we know is that people who feel better about their bodies are more likely to look after their bodies. So if we come at it from from that from that premise then people who are declaring, you know, I, whatever affirmations people declare and I know exactly what you're talking about, well, maybe that's them on their path towards better physical health and mental well-being. We just don't know that. But what we do is we often judge it and we, because of some very unhelpful messaging and public health awareness campaigns that we've had for decades um, mm. We think that sh- um, shaming people and making people feel bad about their bodies is going to drive them to better health, and it actually doesn't. Like, I want to cry talking to you about this. You're like, I'm that afraid to speak about it, but I'm also trying to imagine I I was like 112 kilos when I was 17, and I remember feeling invisible, Yeah, right? Um, I don't know what that's like, you know, it was surgery is a part of my story mm. when it comes to, you know, being big. Yeah. 
I know, I know all about that. The shame that you feel when you're putting on. If you look at me on TV in the first couple of years, I was on. Uh, I, I wore double XL t-shirts mm. the whole first two, three years of me being on TV because I was, con- I was so dysmorphic. Mm-hmm. I believe that's how big I was. Mm. I wasn't, mm. but I truly saw myself as bigger. So I have a, a bit of reference point. Have a reference of point. I'm not saying I know everything. Yeah. But I know that feeling of invisibility. I know that feeling of self. No one can say anything that's as bad as what I say to myself mm. around that stuff. And so I really, I really struggle with, you know, memes and things you see going around or people getting extraordinarily defensive about you can't tell me. It's like, yeah, I don't know, man. You, you might not have 10 toes by the time you're 40. Come on. Yeah, but, you know, I'll share with you like a personal story because he, he's one of our missions is – to help, to get people to mind their own business, right? Like it, yeah. it's, it's actually none of your business what anyone else is doing with their with their bodies. And and I think there's actually a disproportionate That's a good one. I like that. That's really good. Disproportionate care in this country about other people's bodies. Like everyone's up in arms about. It. I just think kind of just mind your own business. Do do your best. Um, and um, but something that I, I share with audiences where the penny drops on this particular subject. Um, so my brother, uh, he played Sean Penn's movie double in the thin red line. And, um, Jason was really charismatic and, um, you know, the girls would describe him as tall and dark and handsome. And he just, uh, he was, uh, magnetic, you know, he was a magnetic character. Mm-hmm. And, um, if I put Jason, um, you know, here and uh, and then put a man in a much larger body next to Jason and then asked 100 people, 100 people, who do you think is healthier out of these two men? Um, because there's so much judgment about and so much conversation about people's weight or health. Those 100 people would have all said 100% Jason, all 100 votes. Look at him. Um, but he was a heroin addict and he hit it so well. Uh, mm. And he died, you know, on a park bench opposite Central Train Station in Sydney, you know, at 27. Right oh, after, you know, sorry, he sorry. came off the thin red line and like, like he just, what a waste. But that's not the point of this story. The point of this story is that we just, we're so quick to judge. And if we could just, instead of judging, um, just be kind and accepting mm. um, and respectful. Those memes, they'll, they'll continue to go around and there's, you know, there, there's yeah. all this stuff. But, but truly, deeply, if we can connect with humans for who they are and what they do. And, and I constantly tell kids the very least interesting thing about you is the way you look. I want to know who you are. I want to know yeah. what footy team you're barracking. I want to know what you're doing on the weekends. Your your beauty is your energy. It's the exchange. It's actually really hard. But and I see their little. I see. I can feel their energy changing mm. in those moments. And I guess it's just another different way that we could view people. Is just this is nothing. <laughs> when you are talking to young people, you know there is. There, there is, a, there, there is a reality about you know. You said like the way you look is the least most interesting thing about you. But look, I work in a visual industry, Taryn. Um, <laughs> you know, it is, it is incredibly important how I look because in a hundredth of a second, people have prejudged the validity of whatever's about to come out of my mouth mm-hmm. based on how I look. Before it's less than a second. Mm. It's you know probably six frames, eight frames. But that changes that look. The way I look changes how much they, uh, how much weight they, or how much they believe or don't believe what it is I'm about to say. So it does it does have a factor, surely. Of course, but the, I yeah. mean, outside of your world and the entertainment world, you know, th- there's other settings where it's not as important. But I guess it's. I think we just need to keep talking about it. I think because it's uh, yeah. it, the first film embrace. It's 2016. I remember. Inter- interviewing Victoria's Secrets models and they were like, I'm so, I, like, I hate the way I look. And everyone else, every other woman on the planet's like, really? Do tell. <laughs> like, yeah, right. But I yeah. guess it doesn't really matter at the end of the day what you look like, what your body looks like. Um, there, it's just the relationship that you have with it. And for a, a lot of people it's distorted unnecessarily because we weren't born into the world hating our bodies. No, no, we're not at all. And it is, it is very interesting watching 
little kids becoming aware of their bodies now versus how it was when I was a young man. <laughs> Essentially, sure. I mean, I, but I guess I, I, what I would suggest would be the common theme, um, no matter what decade you were born in, is when you're really little. Before the world mm. starts, you know, popping some things in your head, you see the sprinkler and you're like, "Nudie, run!" You're like, you're running through it. You hear music and you dance. You know, there's mm. there's a there's a joy and a freedom that w- that we lose over time. And I guess our mission is to to build foundations of values in life um, based on, you know, who, who you are and what you do and how you feel. Um, that's what's most important. And we can only, yeah. we can only just keep chipping away at that, I think, because um, the problem is so oh, grand. <laughs> yeah. Every day after bath time, it's still hilarious for Wolf to throw his towel off <laughs> and just streak through the house. <laughs> Every day it happens. I'm like, this could be the last day he ever does it. I love that you, you have know? that awareness that it could be. So you oh. just enjoy that little tush running through your house. Like, oh, it's mate, the best. it's the most perfect bum in the world. <laughs> uh, yeah, because, you know, when G was about 12, we used to read books in bed with her every night. Mm. And then one day we said, well, book you once tonight. She goes, I'm okay tonight. It's okay. We did not realize the night before had been the last night we would ever lie in, book, in bed and read books. With I, her. Think that's a, I think that's the cruelest, <laughs> toughest thing about parenting. It's like it's there <laughs> and then it's not. Um, I, I remember um, when my son, my eldest son, he was going to get his peas and I remember the last couple of weeks after kind of having to do multiple school runs, we had four kids across three schools and it was always hectic in the mornings and I yeah. remember the last couple of weeks going, I oh, don't complain about this because this is the last time because now he's like toot toot on his peas off to school and I'm like, no. See you boy. See you boy. Yeah. <laughs> Out. <laughs> I'm guessing, you know, mum's, uh, you know, published tour star, mum's been, you know, to Canberra, mum's got fancy medals. Go mum. Is it, do, do they, they don't care to you, do they? Of course they don't. And you know what? I wouldn't actually have it any other way because, um, <laughs> well, there's actually a couple of things going on there because if you could imagine my teenage boys are 17 and 15 uh, and the first film Embrace had me on a, on a movie poster naked, tasteful, it was about body image. I was covered up but you could only imagine what that would have been like for my boys. It actually wasn't all smooth sailing, having their mum do the work that I do. And even the yeah, film, right. you know, in Netflix I went to a surgeon and I, you know, a surgeon told me where my boobs should have been and, you know, I was, you know, pretty much naked. Um, so... You know, I've put my body on the line for a cause and for a reason and for powerful storytelling. Um, but the boys didn't sign up to it, but they've been taken on the road. So, in fact, I, I don't try. I just business as usual at my house. It's nothing about what I do, to be honest. What do you tell them about it? Like when, because uh, Wolf is, George has kind of known about it for a while, but um, Wolf is like, Dad, how do you know that guy? I thought, I don't. I think he watches some TV that I do. Like when people come up and say hi. Right. Um, how do you talk to your kids about that? Well, I think they've seen it for, I think because um, mostly it's lots of uh, women because of the first film. I think they've grown up with it. So they've, they, they just, it, not expected. It. It's not like celebrity yeah. status, um, but they certainly, they're, just, they're cool with it. You know, they're always lovely and polite and, um, it just sort of it just sort of happens, and I I try and if, if I'm not with the kids, the transaction and, and the stories and the chatting can be quite long. But if I'm with the kids, you know, I'm kind of like, thank you so much, and and then off off we go because you know I do try and keep home life as as separate as I can from what at times can be a bit of a hectic world. We talked about um, you know I was mentioning before that the way that I spoke to myself was worse than anyone thing anything that anybody else could ever say to me. Because it was a combo of everything. You know, one person could only be so creative. But if I combined what that person, that person, that person all said to me and then I believed it to be true, then boy, uh, I'd give myself a triple threat. How do we, um, you know, we talk about, you talk about self-loathing versus self-loving. Why is it, what's a way that we can start changing that? What's a way that if, if we don't realize we're doing it, what's a way that we can start changing that, particularly when it comes to our bodies? Yeah, I mean, I think the process of learning to have a better relationship with our body requires effort. And I think um, just trying to constantly share with people that not one film or a book is just going to have you transformed um, and on your new path. It's forever changing. And just like our bodies are forever changing, I think it's a commitment um, just like with other things, you know, in life, whether it's building muscles at the gym or uh, working on your mental health or whatever it might be, I think it's a commitment to being aware that 
the way that you talk to yourself um, in your head and the relationship that you have with your body is not serving you um, and it's not setting you up in life to, you know, go on the adventures and say yes and go down the beach and jump in the pool, whatever they might be. I think it's having that awareness and then making a commitment to unpacking the the array of information that's out there, books, film, people, storytelling, having conversations. One of the things I did very early on with my group of friends was I am really tired of hating my body. Like I'm a little bit exhausted by it. I've been doing it my whole life. I've been dieting. I've been doing this, that, and the other. What about we just try and something real radical and never say anything negative about our bodies or anyone else's bodies again? And it was like, what? <laughs> and at the time, it sort of seemed like a bit of an odd request, you know, like what you bring to your friend, your friend circle was like, can we, can we have some rules and parameters? But what it actually did was it enabled us to appreciate how much time we were spending talking negatively about our bodies or judging others or talking about dieting or talking about whatever it is and how boring all of those conversations were. And then on reflection again, after a few years, how much more exciting and fun our catch-ups are. I mean, I've heard it so many times, groups of people when I go to restaurants and I just happen, it's like it happens to me. It just must be the way the universe works where I'm always sitting next to someone who's bitching about their body. It's just like I'm a, a moth to a flame. And I just, I listen, I think, oh, that, I remember that, but it doesn't have to be that way. Wow. What are we, oh, you know what? That guy, he's got a really lovely smile. <laughs> <laughs> he's got, got lovely eyes, wasn't he? <laughs> That's a way you can do it, I guess. You can get in that way. <laughs> if we, if there's someone in our life that we are, you know, we notice is is struggling a bit with this stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a, a partner, a romantic partner, for example, how can we support a, a partner who's going through this? Yeah, I mean, I think it just comes back to um, just listening. Um, mm. I think I've had this conversation with my husband so many times about just um, naturally just wanting to fix <laughs> all the things that come up because you don't want your loved one to be in pain. Um, but I think just listening and making sure they're supported and actually not stepping up to be the one to support because we often don't know what to say or do when it comes to partners. So we're very much focused on parents say and do this to your kids and don't say and do this. Partners is actually um, is a new world for me because even I, a few years ago when I my 19-year marriage ended, I found myself dating when I thought, hang on a second, that was not in, that was not on my that was not in the cards in my future. And then next minute I'm on Bumble and then you're having a date and you're like, oh my God, someone's gonna this is me when I'm embracing, right? I'm doing the work. I've been embracing for years and I'm like, la da 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 da. And then I was like, holy shit, someone's gonna see my body. And I had to yeah. think about that. Um, you know, the body that they've not seen grow three babies and give birth and breastfeed 4,000 mil. They've not been on that journey. So I'm not so sure other than listening and loving <laughs> that I have too much other adv advice to share on that one. But it's probably enough yeah. anyway. Love and listen. Oh, man. I was uh, – well, I didn't – I did not give birth before I uh, started dating again. But yeah, I started dating in my forties. I did not like it. After I got the, it was terrible. <laughs> Speaking of flicking through photos, by golly! Can I show off on Bumble? The guy, the first guy I swiped was who I married. <laughs> and look, if they're not a client by tomorrow, I'd be disappointed for you. <laughs> I just thought that was like efficiency 101. I was like, yeah, I'm really fucking busy. So one night it wasn't. But that world is terrifying when you're in, because same, me too, 40s. I don't know how to do, I don't know how to date. I don't know what I was doing. Phones didn't have cameras on them last time I was single. <laughs> That's was true. Like, I literally had to call people. <laughs> yeah. Like it was, it was the worst. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was interesting about, you know, speaking of body image, you know, one of the, I was very clear in that the pictures that I would put up were pictures that were very recent. Mm -hmm. So it became evident quite quickly that the people I was 
having coffee with or maybe having lunch or maybe even a dinner with, they were using pictures which were quite old. <sighs> that old chestnut. I've heard this oh, many mate. times. Or the, like the, fi- the whole filter situation. It doesn't right. make sense because when you meet the person, yeah, why would you even want to set yourself up like that? But also, this this is quite a signal for me. It's um, mm. all right. You don't actually, you're not actually okay with who you are here today. That's some work that you get to do without me. Good luck. <laughs> totally, <laughs> absolutely. But how did you do dating apps when you've got such a public profile? I was in America. <gasps> So nobody knew. That's gold. I did. I did like a photograph, and not that you know um, that I had such a public profile that everyone would know me, but definitely some people would. So I had hair like yeah. across the face, like <laughs> just like wind swept in a lot of spots. the classics. The classics. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I never held a fish or had a tiger, but um, <sighs> yeah, I was very grateful it was it was over when it was when it was over. When we are supporting, we're just talking about partners mm. again. I. I I remember what, like, I started to come out of the dysmorphic thing very slowly, and someone who very much cared for me uh, was trying to let me know that this was going on and that I actually was a lot in a lot better shape than I thought I was. And I truly, I was upset that they were telling me such a thing, which I believed was so wrong. And I kept denying them. Again, no, I'm not. And I kept shooting down and denying what they were trying to tell me. That could be very difficult for a partner mm. who's trying to go, no, actually, you look great. You look really healthy. Yeah. And I'm going, no, I'm not this. Look at that. Look at this. Look at this photo here. Look how many chins I've got. Like, what, what, can, what, what, what can we do to help a partner who's doing that? Because I was definitely doing that. Well, what helped you? Um. Uh, to be honest, it was only years later mm. when I just started to realize that um, this person who's a stylist is a professional and I will trust that their career is also on high, on on show here. <laughs> so they're not going to put me in something that I don't look good mm. in. So I will just trust. I will hate it every second I'm wearing mm. it, but I will trust that it looks okay. Mm. And having... When you do photo shoots, for example, it's not the same anymore. But they, you know, sometimes you get it. It's like six, eight people standing around a Morongo rope, and every one of them going, "Yeah, that's great." And me looking at going, "You can't see the love handles that are eclipsing the sun." Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're like, "What are you talking about?" No. And I just have to go. Oh, I'm seeing something that they're not. They would say something if there was something that'd be said. Thanks very much, brain. I appreciate it. But that was years later, years. It took me a long, many, many times doing that. Yeah, and I, I guess it's that that's the mental muscle that you need to build, isn't it? But but in my experience, I've been told something that I don't believe myself. I could be told a million times and it's, it, unless it's my truth or, or mm. unless I'm a little bit closer to the truth for myself. That's the only way I can hear others. But I think that's the, that, that is the journey, isn't it? That That's the that's the internal work that we need to go on, that we can have supportive voices around us saying those things, but unless we believe it ourselves, does it help? It ha- yeah. You know, for me, it hasn't. <laughs> yeah. Angie McMahon was here the other day, the musician, and she, uh, we were talking about ex- exercise as a way to regulate one's mental mm-hmm. health. And she was saying how only recently has she started to embrace it and we kind of talked a bit about it, and she has this fantastic line. I'm going to mess it up, but it was something like, exercise was something that only girls who wanted to be skinny would do. Mm. And I didn't want that, so I didn't exercise. Mm-hmm. And and I kind of thought, that, that's really interesting, you know, because that is very much how it's sold. Exercise is something you do if you want a fucking good rig, you know, <laughs> if you want to look yoked, yeah. if you want a six pack. <laughs> that that's what it? people who exercise do. That's what they want. That's why they exercise. Exercise is not, you want to sleep great? Do you want to have things that used to really shit you be fine? Mm. Exercise. <laughs> totally. Isn't it? Is It's such a, but, but see, exercise in itself. The, the relationship that so many people have with it, it feels like it's something that some people have to do. It's like the, mm. we've got the relationship so wrong with exercise. Maybe that's just the way it's been sold to us or it's just the way that we talk about it. It's like yeah. moving, 
you know, moving my body is the best part of my day. Like it's just, that's probably, you know, one of the most joyful parts of my day, aside from dropping all the kids at school and saying bye (laughs) and then heading to work. But I just, I I hate the thought that people think it's, yeah, something that that's forced upon them or that they have to do. Uh, It's Mm. like having the gym routine. You know, people like, oh, I have to go to the gym. I'm like, oh my gosh, who's holding a gun to your head? Like how, what's happened, why? And their relationship with it is, I don't it doesn't feel very empowering. And the science, the science shows that if you, even if you get to the gym, mm. the science is profound. The science shows if you have a negative mindset around the stress your body is under, your body will interpret the stress it's under as a negative thing and not adapt itself in a healthy way. And in fact, well, you will not get the benefits of that exercise. That's <laughs> wild. Fucking isn't that? treadmills, you will not, you'll just be puffed. Your body won't change. Yeah, I've never, I've, really? I didn't even know that was a piece of, I mean, intuitively it makes all the sense in the world. Tara, there's like three hours of Huberman that will blow your freaking I mind. I love Huberman. Okay. That blew, completely blew my mind is our, our, our mindset or our attitude towards the stress response changes what our body does with it and how our body interprets. This is a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah, this is difficult, but we want to do it so we'll get better at doing it versus, oh, this is horrible. Mm. I don't want to do this, so I'm going to avoid it and re- reject it. Oh, my it. gosh. Uh, I love um, – I have to go find that um, that podcast because, I mean, that that's – intuitively what we talk about all the time it's like find the ways in which you want to move your body that's you know fun and joyful in particular yeah. for kids you know we just want them to yeah, have yeah. fun and enjoy sport um or enjoy moving their bodies however they want to so ah cool yeah. tip thank you are you welcome like having literacy with your own body and literacy with being able to move your own body is is something i did i did miss out on and you know i see you know g dance her whole life uh, she's a Pilates instructor now and just seeing how Wolfie, you know, moves his body and like it's so important, so enormously important for how your brain works and how you solve problems. And, yeah, the exercise, I lost a ton of weight when I was about 19. Mm. His exercise stopped being a thing that an angry man with a whistle and a beard mm. was forcing me to do when calling me names because it was the 80s and you could do that to high school kids. Mm. And it started becoming a thing that I would do in the park with my friends. Yeah, right. And I lost about 20 kilos in three months because I was 19 and I was a protein synthesis machine. (laughs) (laughs) That's so, isn't that, yeah, isn't that really telling, isn't it? Yeah, Yeah, the things that, I mean, that's something that we actually talk about now at the Embrace Collective. One of our initiatives is the Embrace Sport Playbook. And one of the things is mind your language, you know, what you say about bodies and even pigeonholing kids into certain positions on the sports field because of their body shape. It's just. I was always goalie, Taryn. Always goalie. Yeah. And I was never in the ring because I was too short. So, <laughs> yeah. I, but but yeah. we don't need to. And this is, you know, uh, in speaking with um, Kieran Perkins, you know, about this, which was such a great conversation to have just a couple of months ago. It's like not every child is going to be an Olympian. So so funny listening to an Olympian say that and talking about it in this context um, yeah. and that we've got to apply <clears throat> some really common sense principles to keeping kids in sport for longer and not putting them under the pressure that they're, at, yeah. that they're currently under to be the best and, and to win um, and, like, just, just enjoy your body, enjoy a sport and, and have fun. Simple. That's all it needs to be. Next week is International Women's Day. Mm. Paint a picture rather than a hope for. Let's 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 do the thing, the the great act as if. What are we, what can we act as if when we're thinking International Women's Day around around body image? How can we how can we behave on International Women's Day as if a world exists that is not existing mm-hmm. yet? Um, I think, and I often think this on International Women's Day and any other significant days that we have, is that they're they're wonderful days to to put really important issues, you know, on the radar and we talk about it. But every time it happens, I feel like it just goes away as quickly as it came. We had our moment, we do our hashtag and we do our photo. Um there were cupcakes. Come we on. do cupcake. I mean, I'm okay That's with the, the work, cupcake George. part, but um yeah. I think what I would love um is for everyone to to take a practical step to embracing mm. their body more than they did 
and treat it like it's a superpower. Because what we what we see in leadership and what we see in people is that people who have this high appreciation um, of their body image and they feel more um, content with how uh, they look, they're more often uh, then able to focus their time and their energy on more important issues in the world. Um, our bodies aren't a problem uh, and there's bigger fish to fry. I think that's probably the way I would say it. So on International Women's Day, it's about getting really practical. What can that look like? What can it, what can it look like to, what's a practical step? What's it look like? Okay, so if you're a parent, um, it's definitely watching the Embrace Kids documentary. If you're a woman, um, it's watching Embrace that is still on Netflix. Um, we had a piece of research published in a medical journal that showed that women who watched that film had a higher appreciation of their body image after seeing it. So that's really powerful um, in BMC, Women's Health Journal. Um, so there's two things. And I think perhaps the third being the commitment to embrace your body a little bit more, whatever that means to you, because I think everyone has the capacity to do that. And I often joke that embracing your body should come with a 100% money back guarantee because it does feel pretty cool. It feels quite liberating. It's quite energizing. It's it's good for everyone around us um, to make the commitment. Can I give you four? Never say anything negative about your body or anyone else's body again in front of our young people because they're really struggling right. and they don't need to hear it. And we need to be the role models for them. So we need to show them the way and show them how to embrace their bodies. And the only way that we can do that is getting it right for ourselves first. Did you go for a run today? I have not been for a run. I went for a walk, but I had COVID last week. So I've been trying to just take it a little easy. But no, there'll be a run in my future in the next few days. Yeah. What does running do for you? I have a brain that never stops thinking and it's really wait I shouldn't say it's exhausting is it it's as energizing as it is exhausting but the only thing I can think about when I'm running is don't walk keep running keep running keep running I just I don't know I lose myself on runs and um so it's great for my mental health and I love the challenge of a run I love finishing a run because I don't naturally love running so it's it's really hard for me to do so I love finishing it and just that sense of accomplishment that I did something that pushed me outside of my comfort zone. The first K and a half always sucks. I don't care. I don't care who you are, where you are, what kind of runner you are, how – first K and a half, first mile, always sucks. Always. Doesn't it? Yeah, I just – Everything. Because I ran the first marathon to stick it up the jumpers of all the trolls that said I was, you know – fat and a bad parent and a bad role model and all the things they said to me. So I, I, I ran my first marathon to put in the film. So it was like all, all the producers were like, just get to the finish line. And I'm like, yep, I'm just going to get there. And I made it. And then I did my nice. second marathon in Adelaide to raise funds for the Embrace Kids film. And now I'm thinking the more runs I go on, I'm wondering if there's a third marathon for me. Not for the film, right, not for yeah. kids, not to, yeah. you know, say piss off people. It's just for me. So we'll see. Yeah. Gold Coast, fast, flat, no hills. I watched people do the Gold Coast Marathon. I, I know that's like a yeah. fast stretch from doing it, but I watched them when I was there last year from like a really high building and I was like, look at them. And yeah. it is so flat. And I, but it was, it can yeah, be yeah. hot though. Yeah. That's all right. There's water. It's the hills that destroy it. I, I can't run anymore. I'd run a bunch of marathons, but yeah, it's it's I I, I know it. It's a, the same thing. Like no matter who you are, the first bit sucks, but no matter who you are, when you get home, it's always better than if you didn't do it. Oh yeah, isn't it? Every time, you should absolutely do another marathon. And don't tell anyone till afterwards. <gasps> That's what I thought about doing. But I'm yeah. such an overshare that I'd be, I'd be really hard if, you know, I do this podcast, I'd be like, oh, I just did 30Ks this morning because I'm training for a secret marathon. Just, I went for a run today. Got it. I can. That's it. Good, good run today. Good stretch. You don't have to tell distances. It's not a deposition. I know, but it is when you're not a, see, I was going to say when you're not a runner, but I am a runner. But when you like run 30Ks, yes. you, you would just, you want to just drop that into a, you're at the checkout, you're like, oh, I just ran, no, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but you only do that like two weeks before the big True. one. You only do it once. <laughs> True. <laughs> True story. And then, you just kind of, and then you're in the taper. I hate the taper. Oh, I hate the taper. Because of the mental um, mindset? But, because you're like, isn't oh, yeah. it the worst? worst? Couldn't handle it. You're an absolute gem. 
again, I deeply apologize for being late. Um, but my house now doesn't have bin juice in the gut in the living room. So thank you for giving me the time to do it. Thank goodness for that. Thanks for having me. Thank you.